Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to USTA Florida's Here to Serve podcast. My name is Laura Bowen. I'm the Executive Director at USTA Florida, and today we're going to dig in with a very special guest on a topic that we haven't covered before. So I'm not going to tell you what the topic is. I'm going to let our guest talk about it, but I am going to introduce our guest today, and it is George Henry, who is the tennis supervisor for the city of Palm Coast. He also is the former head women's tennis coach at Bethune-Cookman, and he has a wonderful background in tennis that is way beyond his title today, and I'm just super excited to have you here, George. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Laura, it is my pleasure, and thank you for inviting me today, and hello to everyone out there. Um, this is, uh, I think, a blessing being here, really, because I can really expose my inner self <laughs> a lot. You know, I've uh, been involved with tennis for several years now. I just turned 60 uh, Ooh, in happy, January. Happy birthday. Happy 60th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's 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 been a journey for me. So over half my life, uh, three quarters of my life, really, thus far, uh, involved with tennis. And so here I am. You know, happy to be with you. Happy to share some of my experiences and my research with you. Uh, so take it away. Awesome. Well. Again, I'm super excited today. I'll try to contain myself because I know we only have a fixed amount of time. But before we dig into your research, which is really the topic today, maybe you can share a little bit about your background and how you were first introduced to tennis. Okay, wow, that was many years ago. But it, but it's funny, I, I um, initially started out playing other sports. Um, I didn't get into tennis until 15, 16 years of age. Okay. Um, my father was, I grew up military brat. My, my stepfather was um, in the army. So we lived in Germany and all over the country. Um, but back in the early seventies, he got out of, he got out of the, uh, the army and moved to Ledger, Connecticut, Gales Ferry, Connecticut. Actually, it's the home of Mohican Sun ah. um, and, and the, the casinos in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I was there, the casinos weren't there. It was a nice uh, seaport area. Um, so a buddy and I kind of started playing tennis at a community center. We would just go down, ride our bikes down and start playing. And I would actually watch my father play with some of his, uh, you know, ex-military and friends. And, you know, we just started. I, I was actually I avid football, baseball. I played a little bit of basketball and, you know, I got into tennis and it was, it just took over my life. So I, I, I picked the bug up. I, I caught the bug very early and it's changed my life ever since. And uh, once my father, actually I was, uh, I had a, we moved in the ninth grade going, going into the 10th grade in high school, we moved to Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay. And, Wilmington, so we from Ledger, Connecticut to Wilmington. And in Wilmington, my father had a fraternity brother who was Dr. Hubert Eaton, who I had just read about in the autobiography of Athelia Gibson. And he's the doctor that Athelia lived with when she moved from New York to train uh, to be a professional tennis player um, in Wilmington. So I had, I had asked my dad, I was like, you know, do you, did you meet Dr. Eaton? Do you know who he is? He said, yeah, he was over at our house. We had a fraternity meet. So that was really my introduction to being a part of being a legacy, you know, the legacy of tennis. So I had researched her and, you know, got to know about Arthur Ashe and, you know, later on. So when we moved to Wilmington, I tried out for the um, high school team and I went to Hargett High School and actually, I graduated high school the same year Michael Jordan graduated high school in 1981. Did you really? From, from Laney High School. So that's a little tidbit. But, um, but tennis was my sport. And Dr. Eaton would give me lessons over in his backyard. And that was the same court that Athelia Gibson trained and 
you know, had visitors come in and, you know, everybody knows that the Gibson, who was the first one to win Wimbledon US Open, first black um, to do that. So years later, and, you know, at, towards the end of my career, career, I was actually a pallbearer for Thea Gibson's funeral when wow. she passed. So that's part of a legacy, you know, and I- Did you I, ever I, play I, golf with Althea? I never played. I actually never met her. I just heard so many stories from Dr. You know, Dr. Eaton, how they trained her and, you know, what she had to go through in her lifetime to be as good as she was. And then a good friend of mine actually did a doc, documentary Rex Miller, who uh, did the documentary that played on PBS about her life. So it's it's been full circle for me. So that was just my introduction. And, you know, I, I from high school, I ended up going to college and I got a tennis scholarship to North Carolina Central University. Mm -hmm. And it took many years to get out of there. I was in and out and playing <laughs> tennis and, you know, but I ended up going back and you know, getting a degree and I played satellite tennis and, you know, tennis for me just opened my whole world up and, and I was able to meet and it was introduced to very famous people, a lot of great people, a lot of not so famous people that really helped me in my life um, and, and to be a better person. And, you know, so it's just been a, it's just been a real whirlwind for me you know, through this great sport of tennis. And that all leads me to my research. And, you know, it was, it was funny. I, I moved down to um, this area of Florida to, to be the head coach and tennis director at Bethune, uh, Bethune Cookman University, who had a, a very great historical um, place in HBCUs, historically yep. black colleges. So I decided to go back and get my master's and started that. And, you know, it took two years to get it. And, and while I was coaching and, you know, then COVID hit and that changed a bunch of everything, but I used COVID to kind of help me focus and really help me um, do my thesis, which as you know, now my thesis, uh, the topic was, for me, was increasing African American tennis player participation at a selected HBCU. So that's, well, that's where a, we. That's, that's what that's we're going to we talk about today. And, you know, and so. we're very grateful you came to Florida. You know, we were just talking before the podcast started about this is not your first go round in the state of Florida. You've been here before. And um, so we're happy to have you back, of course. And I can tell you that uh, before before I get into the the thesis itself, you talked about sort of the pandemic and going for your master's and the thesis. But the topic of your thesis, how did is that something that you really had, you know, wondered about and wanted to research for a long time, or did the pandemic or your experience at Bethune really drive you to that topic? How how did the topic itself really come about for you? I think for me being back in school and really, cause I really was an underachiever in my undergrad, you know, it took seven, eight years to really finish. Um, I really wasn't, probably wasn't in the best place to really, I was more focused on tennis part of it mm -hmm. than, than, than the schooling. But so it was like, and then I, my, my daughters, I have two daughters, um, one who grew up in Florida in South Florida and the other who's up in New York and 19 and 22. So I, when I, when I, <laughs> excuse me, when I started the class, I told my instructors, my advisor, I said, you know, I want to get my master's before my daughters get there. So I had a little oh. jump on. So okay. actually my oldest daughter started her master's. She graduated from North Carolina Central this past year. And um, she started her master's degree. She played golf for North Carolina Central. Okay. My youngest daughter is a freshman at Middlebury College in Vermont. So mm -hmm. she, um, excuse me. So she, um, she basically is on her way. So I got a little jump on them and hopefully it motivates them to, you know, pursue their, their academics. And, you know, the thing about me was funny. My mother and I 
had a discussion through my whole process of, of schooling. And I'm, I maintain a 4.0 going through, which I had never done, mm. you know, in, in, in elementary and middle school mm -hmm. and high school. So it was just funny. It was so funny for me to um, go through this process. And I love, I love that you did this though, looking at it through the lens of the experience that you have, because I remember right. doing my thesis in college, which happened to be on the um, representation of women and the gender yeah. wage gap. Yeah. But I was looking at it through a 21 year old lens. I wasn't looking at it the way I would now, you know, much later in life, having the the life experiences I did, you know, now. And I That's think, oh, how much better that thesis would be now with my yeah. lived experience yeah. versus the reading and the research and just sort of relying maybe on other people's experiences. Yeah. So personally, I love that you did this and you arrived at this later because you can see throughout the entire thesis your experience yeah. coming through this paper. That's and so it adds so much more to it than just the research and the data, it's, you have a perspective that's, you know, priceless in terms mm -hmm. of framing this. So that, that for what it's worth, I mean, I, I kind of love that how you got I mean, to that, this that, point. that means a lot. I mean, because that was one of, for me, probably really framing this was the toughest thing for me. And my, um, my advisor really, really, I, she, she saw something. And she kind of steered me in that way. She said, you know, George, you have something that a lot of other students don't have. You know, this, this, this tennis, you know, you're here for tennis. So, you know, it, 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 you know, take it and run with it. So, mm -hmm. and for me, the frustrating thing was there really wasn't a lot of research out there. Yeah. On, with this topic, you know, I relied on a couple books and it kind of brought in different components of college athletics and, you know, from a team perspective to leadership to mm -hmm. Title IX. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was another issue. Actually, I brought, I had to bring a Title IX case against Bethune in their the direction of their uh, women's tennis team. But mm -hmm. I was doing research, so it was in the forefront of my thinking. I'm like, look, mm -hmm. this, this is an easy fit for me. So, yeah. you know, and it, it was really, it was, you know, I wanted to do it for someone else. I didn't think it was fair for the women to have to go through, the young ladies to have to go through the struggle they were going through at a school like, you know, Bethune-Cookman, who was founded by a woman, know, yeah, a woman. Black woman <laughs> yeah. who, you know, was, was worldly known. And here we are, the tennis team. And she was, I found in the research, she really was a supporter of the sport of tennis, she oh, she really? held the national the uh, national ATA back in I think the fifties at the school. They had six mm -hmm. clay tennis courts at the school, and she mentioned in a letter that I just ran across that you know that was that was a, an event that hundreds of people from all over the world, the Virgin Islands, and everywhere mm -hmm. came to participate. So, and that and this was twenty twenty one, you know. That 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 I was looking back at a at nineteen fifty something. This happened. It's interesting, you know. I know this isn't in the question, so uh, but I I will tell you that I was fascinated by the the part you did on Title IX in here and mm. and really focusing on sort of the idea that you know looking at the number of programs is one thing, but looking at the quality of you know the resources and the services being provided and the equity part of women's and men's athletics mm -hmm. was a whole nother thing. And that really tied nicely into, you know, some of the other pieces of this research is that clearly there's an equity gap, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's the part that I think we miss a lot is that that idea of of being equitable and how that really does affect the opportunities that are available to marginalized groups. So I, I was exactly. happy that you added that in there because that was a a really uh, kind of a nice way to frame that piece of it. And then, of course, I have some questions for you specifically on the okay. differences in what you saw in the data with the men and the women, which also fascinated me. So let's dive in. I read this paper okay. twice, and I'm going to tell you right now, we could have a two or three hour <laughs> podcast on this. I will probably read it again. 
And if, you know, if we get a chance, we maybe we'll be able to link to it so other people can enjoy it as well and dig into some of your wonderful research. On page 17, you made a really profound statement that Af uh, American tennis is at a critical point, and yet the industry itself, which uh, we're part of, seems to be focusing on sort of these things uh, and you gave a couple examples, UTR, pickleball, et cetera, that really aren't critical to the grassroots growth of tennis. Could you talk a little bit more about that and why the HBCUs are a critical part of growing the game? I, um, that's, that's kind of interesting. I didn't, um, 17, when, it, when, 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 when I initially sat down and, you know, I, like I said, I, I look back when I was playing and, you know, at, at North Carolina Central, at, in our conference, CIAA conference, we had a school, Hampton, Hampton Institute, Hampton, Hampton University, who probably was one of, one of the most winningest tennis teams in the country. Um, and they were at an HBCU. We weren't that good, but I know on my team, we had, we were 90 percent you know, uh, black, black or African-American. Mm -hmm. And these are guys that have played tennis, you know, through the juniors and, and, and a lot of us came back because we wanted to play at HBCUs. Those, mm -hmm. those traditionally we knew from playing the ATA national tournaments and, you know, the ATA circuit, uh, which was very prom, which is old, one of the oldest nonprofits um, and probably the oldest tennis organization in the country. Mm -hmm that they had a network already set up and, and young black players were playing against each other and competing. And we knew we could play at a school like Hampton or mm -hmm. Central that had, and some of these schools that won national championships and a lot of people don't even know about it. So I just think traditionally, I always thought there was good black tennis. I just didn't know where, you know, and to see it now where a lot of those you know, African American players don't even strive. They they want to go to you know larger schools, uh, yeah. NC, you know, top Division One NCAA schools. So, I just saw it as being a problem. I mean, you had you you a sport like tennis where African Americans really had to rely on our own system to even yeah. get through the ranks, and really a lot of us don't even know the system that was there and the history of it to even motivate us to do even, you know, gr other great things in tennis. I've always known about great, you know, black tennis players, not just the recent ones, uh, you know, that are doing well in the pro ranks. A lot of them didn't have the opportunity right. to be top professional players. They were good in the, in the juniors and college ranks, but then they had to go work after that. So the, so the, I just, I just think the, the, infrastructure wasn't really set up mm -hmm. for us to the pathway wasn't there for us to endure I mean even I don't know if I'm getting off the subject about this but I'm just to tie it all in I know that once I finished college I would have to go out and work and I couldn't mm -hmm. afford to play tennis and a lot of my counterparts felt were the same way mm -hmm. and so that was it for tennis you know if we were a young black person a black man that you know and even to this day, it's very hard for, you know, African American uh, professional tennis player to even get a job at a at a club. You know, it's it's open, yeah. more open now. So, I just think the pathways weren't. Yeah, and you know, to to sort of emphasize another point about the industry, and you know. I felt this way for a long time, but we're just reading your paper really resonated with me that we have an industry that there's a many components of it that that chase the highest dollar, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it it really is um, sort of built that way, and you know, part of the reason we exist is to deliver programs outside of that space, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think that sometimes we lose sight of that, right? And we we continue to create a system that really is built on where the, where the highest profit is. So the examples you gave is like there's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of teaching professionals and programs designed where, you know, that cost a lot of money and, mm -hmm. you know, the labor costs are high and all of that. So if you're coming, if you're coming into the space and, you know, you're looking for opportunities that aren't high cost, you know, there, the industry isn't always so focused on delivering there. And I think the HBCUs probably similarly to a lot of the public parks that are struggling to deliver right. low cost programs, right? They don't have the resources. Right. There's definitely a have and have not there. And, you know, we're not doing a good enough job of focusing the attention on that space because everybody seems to be up here, you know, in this other, other space yeah, in the exactly. tennis world. Exactly. I know, and I'll just give you an example. I um, There's a program, there's several programs across the country. There's one in particular. Actually, this program is how I met my wife. Um, oh, okay. Who, Tell me. And, and, and it's kind of funny. This lady, Emily, Dr. Emily Moore. Emily Moore was an activist. Whoa. She went to undergraduate school at Morgan oh, State. She, um, she played, she, she, played a little tennis, got introduced to tennis later on, but in Roosevelt, New York, she produced okay. a program no problem. that probably, okay. good. excuse me, Thank I'm sorry, you. that probably produced more doctors and lawyers from that program than any tennis player. She had a few that Renee Blount was one of her students that she took under her wing, who was probably top 100 player, black young black lady. Mm -hmm. Um, but she was more of an activist that would go out in the neighborhoods. And actually, my mother-in-law ran the park in Roosevelt that Emily, Ms. Moore, did her program out of. So okay. years later, I, and the funny thing about that, my first college match, I played one of her players my freshman year as a freshman. We ended up being friends later on, but it's, it's just she would have 50 to 100 kids on two tennis courts. Those programs don't exist anymore. No. Those programs, she would take them to national tournaments or local mm -hmm. tournaments. And, and I mean, it takes that. So that was my kind of my upbringing and, you know, mm -hmm. my involvement with tennis. And so it's not necessarily about the dollar we make. It's, you know, you see potential, you see a community and you want to enhance and, you know, be a part of it and make it better. So. That's that word that just came to mind when you were talking is community, and you're, you talk a lot mm -hmm. about that in your thesis, too, about the importance of creating that community space also on the college campus mm -hmm. side, right? So that, mm -hmm. exactly. that's, that's exactly. very much missing at times. So let's let's dig into this because I'm so let's excited. Go. I just can't, I can't wait. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the data you collected here to me is really, really fascinating. When you look at the percentage of international students participating in tennis versus the other sports that are offered at the HBCUs, it's really eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Did any of this data surprise you? Did, is there anything when you started looking at that, did you say, oh, I didn't expect that, or that's worse than I thought, or that's yeah. better than I thought? You know, I kind of had an idea because 20, you know, 30 years ago, the international players weren't, I mean, even nationwide, you know, a lot of the, yeah. you know, uh, power fives weren't really getting a lot of international players, but I know the influx came in, but I thought it was, it, for me, it was more disheartening because I know in, and, and, and I, I love the international player. I respect them. I think a lot of them really have an advantage because they have more experience and expertise throughout the juniors when they come over here at a higher level. And that was a point I really wanted to get across. Mm -hmm. Not that they were just being international. For a coach, it's much easier to recruit an international player with all that experience that wants to get out of the country they're in and make a better life for themselves. So I, I agree with that. I think that's, you know, that that that's a positive thing. But I think in doing that, just like even with players that are from here it's about putting back also it's about you know one of the ideas I had at being at Bethune was for every international player I did recruit I wanted them to know the history of coming to Bethune and which a lot of even a lot of African Americans <laughs> didn't even know the history mm -hmm. the true history of Mary McLeod Bethune and in, in, in making a 
making a change. So, so it, um, you know, that, that meant more to me than any, you know, thing. Cause I, I believe in a melting pot. I think we all need to be the best we can be to, to, you know, the world is a big place, you know, through my, through my traveling, you know, having a father in the military, I knew at 12 years old, you know, what it was like to live in Europe and Germany mm -hmm. and travel all over during the summer, people are people and good people, are good people, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so as we try to and better, you know, make humanity better, that that's part of the problem. That's what we don't do through tennis, through any of it. It's about, you know, greed or money or whatever. And we got it. We got to stop that. So my, my whole thing with, being at an HBCU, I, I, I realized I want to create a hub and I also want to create an inviting, an inviting situation for international and, you know, H, you know right. traditional uh, African-American students, but tighten it up and have your stuff together, you know. Yeah, so, and that's what really you know. came through here. And I, I hope we do this justice on the podcast too, that the purpose of this research and even the outcomes wasn't to say there are too many international students, right, don't recruit right. international students. It was nothing of that. It was that what does this trend and what does this data tell us about what we are and are not doing well in serving the African-American community and actually being true to the mission and purpose of the HBCUs mm -hmm. and tennis and, and how to create that diverse environment it, and I, I really, like I said, I thought that that the way it was framed, given your experience, was was just a phenomenal look at what the the story that the data told and what recommendations could come out of it. Um, the one thing that I noticed right away <laughs> was that tennis obviously struggles across the board to recruit and retain African American mm -hmm. student athletes, but women's tennis teams fare better than the men's team. So could you talk a little bit about why that is yeah, and maybe yes. what needs to change in order to recruit more African-American tennis players to particularly the men? Cause that seems right. to be like the worst case scenario. You know, that's very interesting. I, I know back in 19, ooh, 1994 in the, in the late nineties when Venus and Serena you know, we're, we're working and, and when they came on the scene, and I mean, that was like a booster shot for women's tennis for one, but, but it was also for American tennis. And it just, it just, you know, it was like a perfect storm in, the, in, in the, for, for women's tennis. And on the men's side, I mean, I know, I know I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of players now some who have even retired after Venus and Serena, who were motivated by those two young ladies that that you know came through the ranks and they they believe, you know, for, mm -hmm. for a lot of males, we don't we don't really have that. We have, you know, Francis now and you know some others now. And I think you're gonna see uh, see a boom of of up and coming players um, that are up and coming players that will be you know, an after afterthought of, you know, these players and, but it just takes that. It takes, you know, if you don't see it, you can't believe it sometimes, you know? And I think we, we've suffered with that, you know? Yeah. But yeah. I, I just, mean, it's a good point. It, it was nice when I was down in Delray beach, Francis was there watching, yeah. which was really nice. He wasn't playing, but he was watching yeah. and we got to see Michael Mo playing there Mike and it, so you, you're yes. starting to see more of that, you know, on the American men's exactly. side, and that gives me hope. Oh, and I hope I, that I maybe do. that'll be a game changer. I, and, and the funny thing, you mentioned Michael Mo. Michael Mo's father played at St. Augustine. He was, I, he played on their team and I didn't play him. I played another guy on the team, but he was top hundred in the world back then. That was Tony Mo, who was his mm -hmm. father, who played okay. at an HBCU. So, and I, when I met Michael, I mentioned, I was like, yeah, Mike, you know, your dad was a heck of a player. He, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what it takes. You, you know, he, I'm sure he had that connection of his father and now he believes he can mm -hmm. go and do what his father did, if not better. Francis, I mean, Francis just, 
freak of nature. I mean, <laughs> that, that he's, he's, to me, he's, he's a special, his, his whole family, you know, I got a chance to really meet him and hang out with him, you know, uh, and he's just a, 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 a he was a, a man in a boy's body, you know, so, <laughs> you know, I, nothing but great things, but he, I think he understands his position and how it's going to impact yeah. others that, 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 that are coming in and, you know, attracting them to the sport. So, it's, I think that's beautiful, you know. I do too. I mean, we need he, more. He, <laughs> it, it, we yeah. do need more. You know, he he's my mom's favorite player, and it it's yeah. it, it's his you know just his his nature and who he is, and um, he has such a magnetic presence about him, yeah. and such a joyful presence, yeah. and love to see it. So, um, well, that's a that's definitely a positive. Yeah. Uh, so, I did want to talk about the piece of your thesis where you talked about transformational leadership. Okay. That really interested me a lot. Um, there's been a lot of talk just in the, you know, the world over the last several years about leadership styles and, you know, how the world has evolved. Can you talk a little bit about why that particular style of leadership is important uh, to team recruitment, development, and the success of these athletes and programs? I, I just think anyone that's about changing for the better. I mean, this world is changing. We, we change, things are changing so quick that we have to understand that each and every day is different. And, and, and if we change it for the better, that's going to help our kids, their kids. And I mean, it's, 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 and, and I really, my whole process of working on my master's really transformative leadership. That's what it all ended up coming to the head about, you know, it was whatever, whether it's, um, you, you, you know, whether you're an eight, being an agent of change for one, that's another term that really was introduced to me and I bought into it. And I just think you have to, in doing that, you have to understand that, you know, things are going to get ruffled and you have to go with your heart and, you know, change for the better. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I think I'm more of a servant leader. You know, I don't like to, and, and, and I found that that um, frustrates a lot of my coworkers or whatever. When I started here, my position, the first meeting, I said, I'm a servant leader. Do you guys know what that is? In my interview, I told them, hey, what did they ask about my leadership style? Uh -huh. They didn't realize I just taken leadership classes. So, you know, and, and so I serve in leadership. And to me, that that's fits my personality. I like to get fulfillment out of other people's success. Um, and it's not just about me. I mm. think there's a balance. You have to lead the ship. You have to, you know. Yeah. And, and transitional leadership is, is about making, you know, being the bad guy sometimes, making that final decision to, um, to do that. So, I, I, like I said, it's change. It's about change. Yeah. And leadership, you know, the new style is, is transitioning. So. Mm -hmm. and, and I loved how you talked a lot about how that applies to the coaching space, right? And that... that mm -hmm authoritarian style of coach which right. which also doesn't work in leadership now right we have different right, generations right. coming in and in that authoritarian you know do what i say this way and you know that 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 style doesn't really allow for the individual development and meet right. that expectation of whether it's a player or somebody you're working with on a different team and i I thought that was really interesting to see how the coaching dynamic also and the expectations of a coach and how to lead a team have shifted. Right, right. I um, And it depends on the scenario. It depends mm -hmm. on the makeup of the team you have, you know, getting, getting, getting team members to buy in to that they're working together for one common goal to be successful, you know, yeah. be the best they can be. So I just think it's all a part of, you know, it's not dictator being a dictator, 
you know, you have to, uh, to get by in and get success. You have to understand that and be willing to, you know, work, work through that. So. And work with each person individually, which yeah, I think you also mentioned on here, which group, is like, exactly. Hey, what this person needs, you know, somebody yeah, might exactly. actually need a more or want a more authoritarian yeah, type of yeah. style, you know, tell me what to do. Yeah. I don't feel comfortable, you know, with exactly. the freedom you're giving me. And then other people won't work well with that. They'll want something else. So I, I thought that was a, you know, kind of another piece that has really posed challenges in leadership and coaching is mm -hmm. that you really, the, your ability to, to really be flexible in that space and try to right. read the situation and get to know the person and say, Hey, you know, what do you need to be successful? And sometimes what they tell you isn't even what the answer is, right? You got to mm -hmm. kind of work through exactly. it a few times. Exactly. Right? exactly. You're right. I mean, there's no, I, I just think there's no one way. There's no way, one way to, you know, find success. You just have to tweak it. You got to, it's like playing tennis, you know, you can't win with power all the time, you know, and, and some days you're off. So you have to figure it out and, 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 you know, make it work. Yeah. So, so my last question about this, because we're, we're running out of time and okay. I want to make sure we get to this last one, because it's probably the most important. The, the takeaway that I took from here with what, you know, maybe I could do differently is that there seems to be a big resource issue when it comes to why HBCUs can't attract the best players. They don't have the appropriate staff, the appropriate budgets. There's not a lot of scholarships available. It doesn't seem that there's a lot of coach budgets happening here for tennis teams. What can the universities themselves do? And I know you made some recommendations in here for how they could maybe bring in more funding and get help with this. And then what can we in the tennis industry do to help address these types of funding and administration challenges that seem to be happening? I I, I think, I mean, and I look back at my situation at at you know, this particular HBCU, I, I came in and I know NCAA allocates, they allow for, on the, on the women's side, they allow for eight scholarships per year. And in my situation, I came in, the scholarships were cut and we went from eight to two. Mm. So, I mean, that could be a monetary, that could be a budget. I mean, I think it's more BS than anything because you can't, <laughs> compete. you can't, you know, you can't recruit. But if, if, if I'm competing, it doesn't matter what school you go to. If I know if I'm in a conference and all the other schools have six to eight scholarships to fill their team, and I have two, two and a half. Mm -hmm. There is no way in this world I'm going to be able to be competitive yep. in recruiting. Yep. So it's not even about our travel budget or any of that. Just at least have a minimal amount yeah. of what it's going to take and be real. You know, mm -hmm. hey, if we're going to have us, we're going to be division one. Let's have understand that certain amount of money has to be allocated so we can at least field a team mm -hmm. and let's go out and compete. Because because a lot of in some of the other sports. Well, we actually in at, at Bethune, the men's team was cut. So okay, that alleviated needing a budget for tennis. But when you have 65 on a roster for football and you have all your other scholarship, baseball and, and mm -hmm. basketball full of scholarships, it's not just I don't want to put that in the in the category of budgetary. Yeah. That's just not being resourceful, not yeah. being you know, not being serious about having a program. So yeah. I think a lot of HBCUs have to deal with that also, but you know, you gotta, we gotta be real with the situation. So now traveling, hey, we, we you don't, I know in our situation at Bethune, we could have, if we could have fielded, uh, uh, and we, they were very competitive before, if we could have fielded a full team, we would be able to play those top schools. They 
you know, most schools come down to Florida for spring break anyway. Right, that's right. So to say that, oh, they, you know, we don't have the money. I think a lot of times people use that as an excuse, but you got to be real also with yeah. it. So monetary, that can be part of it, but that's not the only. I think the intention of what you're trying to do really is the bottom line. If you're intending to be successful, there's certain payoffs you have to have and work harder than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's just my two cents on, you know, the monetary, but you well, know, when I, I went, I mean, when I, one, one other thing, when I went to, yeah. went to school at North Carolina Central, they didn't believe in putting a budget in for tennis, but football had a budget. So, I mean, it's different there now, but you got to be competitive. And, you know, I think too, going back to where we sort of started, the HBCUs have such a rich, rich history in tennis and particularly in supporting black tennis and our mm -hmm. champions to not have a formal commitment in our industry, right? Across the board to say, there needs to be a plan for support, whatever that looks like. You know, yeah. I'm not the right person to say what that is, but to really come together and say, we can't lose this. Like we wouldn't have Arthur Ashe and Althea Gibson if it weren't for the HBCUs. And so I think what ATA- and, and even, even if they didn't play at H, like Arthur played at UCLA, but Athea played at Florida A&M on the men's team. But- the people that trained them had roots in those right. organizations. And that's right. what we don't get. That's what, and that's my biggest pet peeve, even with, you know, USTA and others. They yeah. would much rather go at the US Open and do a step show and do a DJ, four or five DJs, and not do anything productive to say, okay, who, yeah. who are the top coaches or how can we recruit and how can we? Yes you and enhance what they do that's my frustration with it so and i think that's I don't know I how mean, we're gonna change that i think that's well said and and i think it starts here right you know sometimes um what was it that, you know that quote that everyone says from arthur start where you are use what you have do what you can right so right, we're here in florida we have usta florida and i think it's really been eye-opening to see the information and really get a better understanding you know this this has definitely educated me to say okay i i don't i know there's an issue i will tell you none of this surprised me when i started at usta florida one of the very first things i did the first year i was there is i went over to bethune and i did a a job fair mm -hmm. so i had my little table That's set it. up for usta That's right it. And I was like excited because I was like, oh, good. People will maybe want to come work for us. Mm -hmm. The only students who visited my table were the, the tennis team. And it was mostly mm -hmm. the men's tennis team. And none of them were African-American. Mm -hmm. And I was like blown away by this. I thought I knew nothing about tennis. I knew nothing about the international wow. component of tennis or anything. But I thought that was interesting. And over, over time, I've heard that piece come up you know through other tennis programs mm -hmm. but i never really had a good understanding a fundamental understanding of you know the the history of hbcus and i've learned that through ata and different conversations mm -hmm. but then to dig deeply in here and have actual recommendations from somebody mm -hmm. who has lived this and and really knows it to say here's recommendations that are actually meaningful of things we could do I think we, it starts here, right? And if we can start here and take some of the information in here and start doing more of that meaningful grassroots work, maybe we can get more of it to happen elsewhere. So that that would be my hope. And maybe this podcast is, you know, serve starts a point, maybe here to serve sort of starts that discussion and that movement. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And any support you need from me, any assistance or help or whatever, I'll come volunteer for you guys and help out. And, you know, I really think you, you've you really given me support since I've been here in Palm Coast. I mean, you, you were the reason, as I've said before, that we were able to have the professional, bring the professional tournament um, that we had a couple of weeks ago, so. 
Well, we're happy okay. to do it. We, we want to support you. And and believe me, I said it before the podcast, I'll be yeah. calling you. This is not just, hey, we're going to put put a pin in it and, and right, figure right, it out later. Right. This that. is top of mind. And, and um, you'll definitely hear from me. And I know we're out of time. So I just want to thank you so, so much for this wonderful gift for you. And um, again, just for spending a little bit of time today just to share your wisdom and your knowledge with our audience. Well, it was my pleasure and good luck to everyone. Good luck to you. And, you know, I'm on your team. So More to come. We're All on right. the same team. So more to come for us. For those of you who are listening to the audio only version of this podcast, be sure to check out USTA Florida's YouTube channel where you can see the full video version. And of course, for all episodes of the Here to Serve podcast, including topics, guests, and dates, visit USTAflorida.com slash here to serve. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and have a wonderful day.